yeah, I guess I just, yeah, I just really wanted to draw this connection, which, uh, you know, can think of them as two completely separate things, the kind of thing that COVID emerged from and the thing that would maybe a bird flu would emerge from. But this is all stemming from an ecological crisis that is getting progressively worse. You know, we've entered into what's been dubbed the Anthropocene or whatever. Some people have issue with that term in itself. But basically, we've entered into a time of abrupt climate disruption that's human caused. And um, there's just massive destruction of ecologies um, that is ongoing and accelerating in many areas. Um, and it seems that as this continues, we will continue to see these viruses emerge and spill over into human populations. And I, I think that's a focus I've had on the podcast over the past three years, especially since the pandemic, because it was kind of like right. a a rude awakening, like, oh, we can look at, you know, wildfires and all of the different things that are happening, floods and all the consequences of climate change. But one of the major ones is the rise of pathogens that are really deadly <laughs> and causing right. mass disability and all these other, you know, uh, consequences. So, you know, I just really want to hone in on that. And, and that's like partly why I wanted to bring you on is to just sort yeah. of really highlight that point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It'd be, again, based on, so Colin Carlson, who I just mentioned, he, I was talking to him about kind of this very question of like, where do, how do we attribute, what factors can we assign pandemics to, right? In some cases, it's because of land use. In some cases, it's because of agriculture. Obviously, those are overlapping. And there are various mm -hmm. studies that have tried to do this and have tried to to map out, you know, what is the primary contributor? And again, bushmeat, very, very tiny contributor is, is the clear conclusion of looking at that data. Um, Carlson is pretty emphatic that at least looking forward, the biggest driver of future pandemic risk is going to be climate change. And again, that's because pretty much every pandemic that we've seen for the past century and, and essentially our era of modern medicine has been spillover of one kind or another, whether it's from a domestic animal or mm -hmm. from a, a wild animal. Um, and so one key thing in a pandemic then is, is the interaction of species and species that don't typically interact will that if they come together for the first time, that opens the chance for a new virus to be able to make that leap. And um, so Colin Carlson took a look at sort of mammals in particular, in part because mammalian viruses are already more primed to, to jump to humans and looking at where mammals are going to be migrating as climate changes. And he sort of mapped out over the next several de decades, there will be so many exchanges of, of species meeting for the first time that he expects something on the order of 15,000 sort of new viral exchanges. And that's not, that's not 15,000 pandemics, but it's like 15,000 mm -hmm. spark points that could flare up into a pandemic. Right. Um, and so, yeah, Ed Young, um, the Pulitzer Prize writing for Pulitzer Prize winning science writer for the Atlantic um, in summarizing some of Carlson's work talked about the pandemic scene of like, this is going to be like wildfires, like uh, rising mm -hmm. seas, just what we just experienced, what we've been experiencing for three years is kind of maybe what we're going to be experiencing from here on out of just these continued waves of, of more viruses that that spread across the globe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I, I'm curious because this ties into Rob's work and, and many others, I'm sure, but um, you know, what are, what are some of the things that can be done? I mean, I I I don't want to exclude you know possible avenues to improve the situation, right? I mean, we should be opposed to industrial agriculture and this kind of consolidation of food production um, for a variety of reasons, and one of them seems to be to eliminate the or attempt to eliminate the uh, potential for this type of thing to happen more and more. Um, so yeah, what is the kind of the mechanism here? Why is it that if we have more biodiversity, more ecological, uh, more robust ecologies, why does that make it so much better for, uh, for us and for other living beings so that these sort of things don't happen? So we don't have pandemics and epidemics and so on. Yeah. Um, well, I should say the science is still slightly inconclusive and that mm. different studies actually, there, there is some disagreement as to whether or not that is actually true, whether or not intact mm. ecosystems do provide some protection against mm -hmm. um, sort of emerging diseases, uh, generally this uh, like generally it seems like yes. Uh, and the hypothesis is called the dilution hypothesis, which basically says if you have an intact ecosystem, you have diversity, right? And diversity itself is this service in many ways, particularly when it comes to viruses, because 
what is going to happen is any given virus probably will have lots of different kinds of hosts in that ecosystem, some of whom are ideal hosts in that they sort of will pass it on quickly from other to, to other individuals in that species, some of whom, though, there will also be sort of less ideal hosts, so people that can get infected with that virus, but, you know, defeat the virus with their immune system or just, you know, die before they can pass it on or things like that. And so in an intact ecosystem, you have this buffer of all of these different pathways for the virus to move through, some of which will be good for the virus, some of which will be bad for the virus, but that really seems to dampen the virility of, of some of these viruses. And so, yeah, that's the argument. And, and to me, what yeah, the thing that we need to be looking at is how to restore those ecosystems, how to make sure that like we ourselves and the um, food production systems we have exist in a world that has healthy intact, healthy and intact ecosystems so that we get that sort of inherent protection mm -hmm. supplied by a functioning earth. Right. Yeah. Well, I, um, obviously earlier we talked about the the practice of culling the population. That seems like almost a... Um... That that doesn't seem proactive in the sense of like anticipating it. It seems like this is reactive, right? right? This is yes. already happening. A virus is already spreading among the chicken populations. We have to deal with this right now before we, you know, send out a bunch of chickens that may be infected with a virus that will be, you know, sent to grocery stores or restaurants or whatever. You know what I mean? Right. Um, so what are some of the, you know, the term that comes up is biosecurity, right? This is like this new idea almost. It's like come up over that. I don't know how many the recent decades that companies and I imagine government agencies as well are talking about like, how do we secure um, chicken population? Uh, you know, we're talking about chicken specifically. This applies to pigs. This applies to all these other uh, forms of livestock. Um, but yeah, could you talk about like the way, like it's, it's really dystopian actually. I think you were talking about a facility and I think China, like the way that mm -hmm. they protect the workers and the outside world from any sort of, pathogens that might be floating around in these like like a pig facility i think it is right um could you talk about that i mean there's like different approaches yeah. to this but i just want to get an insight into like how companies are attempting to create like safe zones you know or whatever right yeah, yeah so, so the example in china is sort of i hope the dystopian extreme of, of what this mm -hmm. concept of biosecurity can look like but lord knows what the coming decades may bring um but yeah in china there are uh, 13 story tall concrete pig farms. Um, and all mm. the material I have on this all just comes from other reporters from the guardian in particular. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but my understanding from that reporting is that, uh, I mean, so the idea is if, because wild birds, wild animals have these viruses in their bodies, and if they get into our facilities, they're going to wreak havoc, um, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, rethinking the size of flocks or the, the size of, of our agriculture, it says, well, we just need to make as strong a wall as possible between, you know, our human mediated ecosystem that is agriculture and this wild ecosystem that contains all these risks. So in China, yeah, they built this 13 story tall pig farm that has, God, I don't even know how many pigs, but, but what struck me as, as so alarming about it is to, in order to like keep that firewall in place, if you're an employee that works in this pig farm, whether that's sort of slaughtering the pigs or feeding the pigs or whatever, you have to go and, and stay in a two day quarantine as you're transitioning from one space to another. And so it's like, you can't, you can't exist in, in the real world and in this chicken farm. It, it seems very prison like of, you know, you're just yeah. going to be stuck in this place. It's prison for the pigs. It's prison for the workers. And that is, I don't know. When when I look at the fact of wild birds in the US now are carrying bird flu and, and it seems like like what one thing to understand about this bird flu this year is like it, it hit when the first wave of wild bird migrations came, it slightly waned. And then now that we're in another migration season, it's come right back. And there's a good reason to believe that that's going to happen essentially every single migration season from here on out. Wild birds are carrying bird flu. Every time they fly through, it's going to be sneaking into our farms. Um, so yeah, we do need some form of biosecurity. Uh, the scary world would be that the U S would also decide, you know, this is the best proactive thing we could do is just to like ramp up our own biosecurity and, and have that's, that could be the future of our own agriculture. Yeah. You know, it's, it's weird. I mean, you're talking about these people working on these chicken farms, they're wearing hazmat suits. They, they're completely decked in PPE and 
it just kind of i remember how you described it like working on these farms it kind of feels like a casual how do you said it, a casual oh, pandemic yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I spoke to a sociologist who had d- done some field work actually working in a pig production facility. And and he said, yeah, he, he had noted in his, in his own work, sort of the, the lengths that the company was going to, to keep people apart. So if you, if you lived, if two different employees of the production firm lived together in the same house, they were, they were tracking down addresses of employees to make sure that sort of someone who worked on the kill floor didn't you know, live with someone who worked in a rearing facility because that would be more nodes of exchange where it's like, okay, if one of these facilities is hit, that person could take the virus home, the virus could go from employee to employee, and then this employee would bring it to another part of, of our facility where we don't want that virus. And sort of even even this went all the way up to the top level of sort of the manage, managers would not socialize together if they didn't manage the same parts of the facility for because of the same risk of, of sort of carrying viruses throughout there. Um and this was almost 10 years ago, I think, that this field work was done. And um, Alex Blanchett is the name of the sociologist. He said during COVID, he's like, I finally had the language to describe what is going on and has been going mm-hmm. on for years in these industrial facilities. This is social distancing and and agriculture as it stands today. Animal agriculture is this yeah ongoing sort of casual pandemic that is just constantly exists because of these risks um, for having just having that many creatures together. What's the yeah. risk so high that that you have to have these um, policies in place.